welcome everyone to another episode of Private Label Live. I was thinking before the show, things that drive me nuts. I've uh, had some contentious conversations at work today. They're all productive and good. Sometimes it's good to have that. But I, what really annoys me is when you listen to something like this, or you, worse yet, you go to a conference and you sit down for eight hours and everything's a sales pitch and you get 10 minutes of useful information over a six hour period or one minute of useful information over a one hour period. If it's a podcast like this, I want to avoid that at all costs. We're going to tell interesting stories, hopefully, hopefully have a little bit of fun. And really at the end of the day, I hope that each episode we come out with a few things that are really useful that you can use practically when you run your Amazon brands. So that is the goal of what we're doing. Really excited to have uh, one of our favorite brands here at Thrasio, the owner and founder, Ben Leonard, with us today. And Hello. Ben, when we start these things out, um, always love a good origin story. So why don't you tell us sort of your life before Amazon, uh, how you sort of ran into it, and yeah. how you started building your brand? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, so I stumbled into e-commerce in uh, early 2016. By qualification, I'm an ecologist, and I was working as a full-time. Um, for for middle- those lay people, what's an ecologist? Like uh, Brandon, we we study ecology. Um, <laughs> ah, yes. Uh, the uh, the the interactions in the systems within the the biological environment, right? So my uh, I, when I was at university, I specialized in whales and dolphins, and I was a bit of a nerd about that. I still am, really. Uh, and I was working uh, actually in the oil and gas industry, basically telling uh, engineers that they're not allowed to throw pollution, polluting chemicals into the sea. And I enjoyed my job. Um, however, I got really ill at the tail end of 2015, start of 2016. It was actually the third time that I had this occurrence of this, this heart problem. And I'm, I'm fine now. Um, but the third time, the doctors basically said, right, um, the, the, the two times before this have been quite acute, but we need to nip this in the bud now or this could become a big deal, like a chronic problem for the rest of your life. So they gave me a cocktail of drugs and said, uh, rest up for nine months and stop all of your favorite hobbies, which were CrossFit, boxing, running, lifting weights, scuba diving, lots of active stuff. And so I needed something to keep me busy, keep my mind occupied and hopefully keep me in touch with those hobbies, even though I couldn't do them. Uh, my girlfriend, who's now my wife, was uh, studying at the time, and so she was super busy. And uh, it was her who supported me with the with the idea to push on with creating a fitness brand. Um, at this point, I had no idea that I had this like entrepreneurial spark inside me. I had no official business experience. A few years before that, I'd been training at CrossFit with some friends, and we'd had a really hard session. At the end of it, somebody said something like. Um, Oh, we just, we, we beasted it today. And I thought we beasted it, beast, beast, beast gear. That would be a cool name for fitness brand. And I forgot all about it. Fast forward another couple of years to that day in early 2016, I was really ill, been told you can't train. I was sadly tidying out my gym bag and looking at my training gear. I was looking at a skipping rope at the time, actually, or a jump rope if you're in the States. And uh, I looked at it and thought, well, I could do a better job of that. And so, um, I, I kind of went through this process of learning by doing and created a fitness brand called Beast Gear. And uh, three and a half years later, it was doing mid seven figures and I sold it to Thrasio. When you got started, uh, what, was, what was the hardest part of, of, of your really your maturation as, as an Amazon seller? And how did you think about launching your first product and and was it was it the jump rope or was it ancillary products and what 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 i'm really getting circling at here is like we all have moments of serendipity and moments of clear choice that lead to success when it happens Mm -hmm. and uh you know where where were those sort of splits in the road for you sure so the, the first product was a jump rope it was the original the flagship product if you like the beast rope and the reason for that is quite simply, I used a, a skipping rope or a jump rope in my training all the time, both in the CrossFit gym and I, before I'd started my job, I was in the university boxing club. 
and it it was a logical step to to make one of those because uh, I thought I could do a better job of it. Um, the real challenges were that I didn't really know where to start, so <laughs> there was a lot of googling, um, and I was one of those people who. Who, who purely just through ignorance, really, I mean, why would I know? But I, I, I was one of those people who thought when you buy something on Amazon, you're buying it from Amazon. I didn't even know at the time that there was such a thing as third party selling on Amazon. And I didn't know the first thing about setting up my own website. So Beastgear sells on Shopify as well. I didn't even know that there were platforms like Shopify that make it easy to build your own e-commerce website. So the real challenge was just learning by doing. You know, I didn't have a whole bunch of money behind me to start a business and I didn't have a business degree. I didn't take business studies at school. It was a process really from the start, actually, all the way through. Even now I do this of um, trying something, watching what happens, analyzing the results, thinking about what those results mean, tweaking it, and going again, rinse and repeat until you identify patterns and identify things that work and don't work. And of course, there's a lot of, you know, learning from people who are better than you all the time. Um, I never took a course. It was all uh, trial and error, uh, being a member of, you know, communities, Facebook groups, Reddit, listening to podcasts, reading books, and uh, going for it, really. Wow, that's incredible. What was the, are there any specific challenges that pop up during that process or any points in which you stumbled and you're like, Oh boy, this is a big mistake. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, all the time, to be honest, uh, you know, anyone who doesn't, who says that they haven't had challenges is lying. Right. And it's the challenges that, that make your business better because, you know, you learn from them and especially when you fail, um, that's how you get better. So, you know, for example, um, intellectual property was absolutely vital. I came across intellectual property challenges several times. So for instance, um, I made the rookie error uh, straight off the bat of registering my own trademarks, um, which in the UK is very easy. You go to the intellectual property office website and you pay about 200 pounds and you register your trademarks and hopefully they get accepted. Quite often they do get accepted. So you get your trademark certificate back and you think, oh, fantastic. My brand is protected. Well, it's not really, it's only protected insofar as you've protected whatever you as a complete lay person who knows nothing about intellectual property law has put on your application form until you've actually got a professional intellectual property lawyer to do the applications for you, then you're protected. Now, I was lucky because uh, it just so happened that in the city where I was living, which is just up the road from me now, I, a very, very good IP firm was doing um, free intellectual property workshops at the local library. And uh, I came across them and they gave me some free advice, uh, which, which was fantastic. And so not long after I actually paid them to redo all my trademarks and protect the brand, uh, not just in the UK, but right across Europe and also where I was producing my products in the Middle East and the Far East. And then as I entered more markets, um, Australia, um, Middle East and just getting ready to go into the US, I protected the brand there. So that was the first IP challenge. Um, I've got more if you want to hear them. <laughs> what do you think, John? More, uh, I think those are, those are always helpful, I think. Just to, I mean, starting the Amazon business is not easy. And there's, there's a million different complexities. There's a lot to learn. So I think, you know, when people can hear about where, where people messed up is always super helpful. Sure. Um, I mean, this one's not so much a mess up. It, it relates to intellectual property as well. Um, the moral of the story is have a defensive strategy around your brand and your products before you really get going. Um, I, I designed a product. Uh, I came up with the idea and I worked with a, a professional product designer to turn that idea into a, into a 3D product, right? We, we, we created the molds. We took the drawings from those molds and my IP attorney registered the design. Um, now, a design registration and a patent or patent are two slightly different things. Um, so a design registration protects what something looks like and a patent protects how something functions. Now, I didn't need to protect the function of this product because the function was already in the public domain, right? It was unpatentable, but I 
did need to protect what it looked like. So I did, which was great. Launched the product, became the leader in the space for this type of product. And I was selling it at a pretty at a fair price. The, the market leader of this product was not. Frankly, they were ripping people off. My product became much, much more popular than theirs, and they couldn't keep up even after they dropped their price. And so uh, they played dirty tricks. Um, they wrote to Amazon and it alleged that my product was infringing on their design registration, which it wasn't. And Amazon suspended me. And then they wrote me letters uh, demanding that I pay them tens of thousands of pounds or dollars and stop selling. And they wrote the letters in German, knowing that I'm not German. And they weren't German either, but they could do it in German because I was selling in Germany. They, they were using every trick in the book to try and bully me out of this space. And it was clear that they'd done it before, which was why there was no one else in the space except me and them. So, you know, I'm panicking. I'm a one-man operation running my business on a laptop in a cupboard in my house. And uh, I go to my IP attorney and uh, she, uh, she says, hmm, you might be in a pickle here. But we, we, we take a few weeks, we look at it and we realize that A, I'm, I'm not infringing on their design registration, which we didn't think I was. But the best bit was their own design registration was a collection of really pretty terrible drawings from when this enormous brand, this enormous corporation had actually purchased the product from you know, an, an ordinary entrepreneur like me years before. And they'd inherited this pretty terrible design registration, which didn't actually protect their own product. So he wrote back to them and said, A, ask Amazon to reinstate the product. B, uh, leave us alone, or we're gonna have your own uh, design registration uh, invalidated. And C, you need to pay my legal fees and reimburse me for uh, the lost uh, sales I've, I've, I've lost from my product being suspended. Now, luckily they went away, but they never reimbursed me. Uh, but that didn't matter. It was like a David versus Goliath moment. And the moral of the story really is just have a defensive intellectual property strategy. So anyone listening, if you have got your own design, have it registered, get it, have a registered design, get a patent if it's a unique function as well. But most importantly, speak to an intellectual property attorney who knows what they're doing. Do not, bootstrapping your business is wonderful. I'm all for bootstrapping businesses. I'm all for saving money. But when it comes to the legal stuff, don't mess around. Get a professional to do it. And it makes your business more sellable, right? It makes it much more attractive to a buyer when they're looking at it and saying, oh yeah, they've got all their ducks in a row when it comes to intellectual property. This brand has a moat around it. It's protected in terms of trademarks, it's protected in terms of uh, patents and design registrations. So that was you know, a huge challenge. Uh, probably the, the, you know, the, the scariest one while I was, uh, of the owner of the brand. Great. Uh, I want to change Sorry. directions slightly here. And one of the things I'm always interested in is, is sort of um, putting, putting ourselves in, in, a, in a potential for a mental state that will allow you to make productive decisions as your business scales. Yep. And, and humans are interesting creatures, right? Like we, Sometimes we can be in, in ways more fearful of success than failure. And as things really start to emerge and your business grows, people can, can pull back out of, out of sort of fear. And some of that can be committing to inventory, right? It could be committing to growing your product line. As you started to see success and started to emerge, what sensations did you go through? And, and how did you navigate that landscape so you came to a productive outcome? Yeah, it is. It can, it is it can be scary and overwhelming, just as you say. You know, something that I started as a hobby in order to keep me busy and maybe make some extra pocket money was turning into a business that was generating millions of pounds. Um, so on the one hand, you feel you feel uh, pride, which is great, but you 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 can feel overwhelmed and scary when you start sending out purchase orders for hundreds of thousands of pounds or dollars which is something that, you know, in my previous life, I never would have dreamed that I was doing. And so you're taking on quite a lot of risk. So you do have to have faith in yourself and you do have to accept that entrepreneur, being an entrepreneur, you know, does involve risk, right? Um, uh, there's a guy, there's a, a guy over here uh, in the UK called Rob Moore. And he says um, something along the lines of, if you don't risk anything, 
you risk everything, right? You, you have to take some risks. Otherwise, there's nothing on the table, right? That you don't, there's, you've got no leverage, no traction. You have to bet something, right? Fortunately, though, right, the way we can grow these businesses step by step is that it becomes very clear what's working and what's not. So you do get some pretty safe bets. If you know you've got your ducks in a row with your intellectual property, for example, if you know, can see that your product is selling well, if you've got good ratings, if you've built up your assets, so you've got an email list, you've got good social media following, if you've got great relationships with your suppliers, all these things are standing in your favor, which diminish your risk, right? And you can really stand behind those, maybe, you know, take some decisions to get rid of perhaps products that aren't performing so well or aspects of the business where the risk is higher. You diminish your risk as you go on and on and on because the more you learn, the more data you have, the more information you have about what's working and not working in your business, the risk drops. So like, for example, uh, suppose you want to enter a new market, right? I took Beast Gear into Australia and the Middle East. Well, I knew what were my best products in Europe. So I knew that the lowest risk for entering those market was to take these products, right? It's like the 80-20 rule, right? So take, take your 20% best products, try them out first, that type of thing. Yeah, look, I, for us on, on our product launch side, we follow like a, a, a very clear objective anything that can be leveraged any asset that you have when it comes to expanding your product line should be and yes. so what i what i mean by that is like if you actually look at the jungle scout data from 2020 47 percent of all third-party sellers launch entirely new white space products on un, unattached to products they've already launched i think that's a mistake i agree right so in, in ben's case if he had a, his design patent you know i would look into can I make this rope a deluxe rope and have it as a variation on my listing that already is in a number one position? The chances of you, because of your IP, because of your listing itself and the amount of sessions it gets, the chances of that product being successful are, are, are much greater than anything just sort of pulled off the shelf, right? Yep. So, so all of us need to look at our portfolio. And before we make our next risky bet, and I, I you know, I believe in sort of the, uh, that risk-taking mindset, it's something, you know, like uh, that we all need to pursue, but you do it in a measured way. Find easy wins first. They're yeah. there, right? And I can't tell you how many brands we've acquired who didn't take that journey. And you uh, spotted that opportunity, which is why you bought it. Exactly. There's right? so much low-hanging fruit out there and you can diminish your risk further, A, by plucking the low-hanging fruit, right? Because it's low-hanging, it doesn't take much effort to pick it. But, but B, when you build a real brand, if there's anyone listening to this who's just selling like a variety of stuff, like fidget spinners, right? Please stop. Build a brand which solves a, a you know, start with like a gateway product which solves a problem for a particular group of people and, you know, branch out from there and solve a, a series of related problems for the same group of people. And yep. they will buy your stuff. And suddenly your first product is going to have frequently bought together, bought togethers on your listing, which are your other two, three, four, fifth products. It, 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 it just makes sense. It, 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 you're, you're so spot on. And obviously you did that work with your brand, Ben, you know, that's one of the reasons why we acquired it. Uh, but you know, if, if, if whatever your res resource for finding products to launch, if it kicks out tea kettles, right? Or, or something that's totally random and sort of ubiquitous. Um, you know, maybe you want to build a line, I'm not whatever, calling it like a grandma's kitchen. And everything in that brand lineup is easy to use and hold for the elderly. That, yeah. gives, that gives the brand like a mission, a purpose, an identity, and something that's, that's legitimate. So, yeah. you know, for, great, for us, it, it, it is so yeah. niche. Yeah. You know, uh, somebody said, I remember hearing this on the Scott Volker podcast years ago, right? Um, and I apologize to people, my side of the pond in the UK for, for butchering the word niche, but the phrase is the riches are in the niches, right? You, you niche down or niche down until you find a particular group of people who have a particular uh, series of, of, of problems or pain points and you solve those. And it, it, it can be as niche as, uh, I mean, you know what, actually that's not, I'm, I'm, I'm lying. It's not niche. 
products that are easy for the elderly to hold is not niche. There's 7 billion people on the planet and quite a lot of them are old. Um, but it just sounds niche. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I look, I, I agree with you in entirely there. And part of it too, I find with a lot of the business people I run into, it, it's also a sense of, of, of humility. Sometimes the smartest decisions are the ones that just require the most common sense. And all of us, once we have success, we, we're kind of having a tendency to become silver ball chasers. So we're going to go over and try to stretch again from, from zero to build something. When really like the best opportunity might be in something like I, I was talking to a seller last week who started selling uh, toilet gaskets. That's okay. the, like, you know, and he built a $25 million business finding products like toilet gaskets. Nice. Right. That had very low competition and were super niche. Right. And to me, uh, that sort of humility to not overthink things and find yeah. simple solutions for stuff that people actually need. And maybe you don't want to launch an air fryer, even though the top guy sells 4 million a month because it's filled with competition. It might be filled with dirty competition, but yeah. you launch a toilet gasket that might do 8,000 a month in revenue but runs at a 40% profit margin, that's a really good place to start. Why don't you stack that up 10, 15 times and see what kind of business you can build? Yeah, yep, yeah. yeah. completely. Um, I mean, the only thing I would add to that, and I, you know what, I'm, I'm a, what I'm gonna say is, is gonna slightly contradict you, but the contradiction is wrong because this guy's clear, you know, selling toilet gaskets is clearly, he's absolutely killing it. But um, I, I would add to that is if you can, uh, create your business around something that really, you know, get, gets you jazzed up, gets you out of bed in the morning. In my case, fitness products. If you love knitting, then, you know, start a knitting brand, right? If you love knitting, it's possibly not such a good idea to start a brand of motorcycle accessories um, unless you're supremely confident of doing a good job of it. Because if you're not interested in motorcycle accessories, you're, there's going to come a point where you're just not going to take that business forward because you don't have the the oomph to do it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You also don't see the opportunities or where Correct, they are because you don't understand the niche. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we, look, we do some of that. Um, and here's another, an, an example too, with the toilet gaskets, it might be a mundane product product, but maybe I create a brand called gorilla gaskets and they're the strongest gaskets on the market where everyone else just sells them in a plain packaging. Cause it's such a ubiquitous product. Yep. Right. And, and if you don't have, an interest in the thing you're trying to sell. That's not a good start. It's not impossible though. No, you not. can find people who are interested. And like we've taken over some brands that, that are outside of my domain of interest by a thousand degrees, but like we've consulted the sellers who are really into it. And I yeah. could have done just the same by, you know, if I was selling holsters, I could go to a gun range and find a nerd who was like really into holsters. And then I can figure out exactly what the market needs. Right. Completely. And that's the, so you can get around that. You can, thing, but and in it's fact, harder. Case in point is I, so I've on, I've identified a niche of something which will do extremely well for a, a hobby, which I have absolutely no interest in, but having built, scaled and sold a successful e-commerce business, I know how to do it, but I know that I'm not the right person to be the face of that brand and to be the, uh, the driving force of it. I would be better suited as uh, like an advisor. And so for that particular project, you know, I've been seeking the right person who um, has a passion for that, that's that topic. So that's, that, that's another way to do it. Uh, so if you, if I, if you identify a niche and you're absolutely certain that you can, you can, you know, crush it there, but you're not particularly interested in that. And you don't think you're going to spot the opportunities and you're going to be like the authority on that topic, then that's a great, great place to sort of, you know, partner with somebody. Mm -hmm. 100%. Awesome. So I mean, Ben, you 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 built this incredible brand, and you you bootstrapped it, you scaled it, you built it in this multi-million dollar business. How do you and and John asked asked this question better better than I do? But what was the progression of when you started to to think about selling or exiting, or what emotions were you were you going through? How did you come to to that conclusion that it was time to start thinking about selling or doing something different or exploring other opportunities? Sure. So when I started Beastgear, you know, I, I alluded this in my uh, intro, you know, I had no background in e-commerce and I hadn't at that point even considered building a business to sell it, right? 
So when the idea started to occur to me, and this was early 2019, that I, that I could sell it for a significant amount of money, um, I felt mixed emotions. This was my baby. I'd put blood, sweat, tears into this. I'd cry down the phone at 3 a.m. to Amazon seller support, right? Um, and it was really starting to take off. However, um, for me in my life, at that point, I was like 30. Um, my wife was pregnant. We wanted to move house. Um, knowing that I now had the skills to rinse and repeat and do this again, and that I had other ideas for other things in the e-commerce space that I could do, and knowing that I could take money off the table, it made sense for us. And also, right, the, the business was coming to a point where it was not going to be sustainable for me to keep doing this myself with a small virtual team unless I wanted to significantly, significantly scale up the team, potentially have an office locally, who knows. Um, you know, I'd been thinking about entering China, entering the US, and I was at capacity. I was getting fried, actually. And it, it made sense for me and my family to, to, to do that. Um, you know, uh, I was having conversations with my dad around about that time. And he said to me, it was actually, it was advice that he'd once received, which was, um, sell your business at the point of peak romance. And what that means is sell it at the point where you think this could be huge. This is going somewhere. Like we've proven the concept. This has definitely got potential to be massive. But at the same time, if you get it wrong, it might not, right? So there's a lot of upside for a potential buyer, but if you sell it and then they realize that upside, you're not gonna regret not hanging on, but at the same time, if you sell it and then it goes downhill, well, you've sold at the right time, if that makes sense. And perhaps if Beast Gear wasn't my first business, perhaps if I, I'd already had a couple of exits, maybe I would have held on to it and, and wanted to kind of be in charge for seeing where it could go but it was just the right thing for me and my family at, at that stage in our lives, really. You know, entrepreneurs are like, are, we're optimists. Yes. We, we always think that tomorrow will be a sunnier day, even if you live in Scotland, Ben. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, but the, 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 re the reality is, is that uh, shit happens, it does. right? And, and uh, it's, it's really hard to predict when it does, otherwise it would happen less. Yeah. Um, so for me, I think it's it's great to have optimism. I prefer to live my life that way. I know Brandon does too. We're always looking for the thing, but at at some point you have to look back and reconcile. Well, what if this doesn't turn out the way I think it will? Then what's next? And did I miss an opportunity to maximize my returns? And do I need a rest? Do I need yes. a break before I start and get my energy back to do this sort of adventure again? And if you did it right once, you can probably do it right a second time. But um, we've seen a lot of situations where people have taken their brands to their a peak, let's say, and they used all of their energy and bandwidth. And then they maybe pushed it beyond a place where their level of management or expertise uh, wasn't able to, to deal with the growth of the business. What I mean is they needed like three or four employees where they were just one and they overexpanded themselves and then they ran into issues or they started to enjoy some of the money that was in their bank account and they lost focus yep. and hungry competitors were coming up to climb up and, and take over. Uh, so again, like I, I spent a lot of time on this show, particularly talking about uh, your mental state when operating a business, but it's, it's a very important part of, of occasionally stepping back and taking stock of everything. And certainly when it comes to deciding to, exit a business, uh, you want to be exiting on up. It's a lot, it's a lot easier road. Um, yeah. for sure. You know, like we're like, there's a lot of, there are a lot of companies out there looking to, to sell and the ones that are on the way up are in a better position to get what they want. So Ben, I'll, I'll say this, like, uh, my question to you would be, uh, why us? Why, why were we the right partner for you? Well, um, when I made the decision to sell, it was early 2019. And uh, now everybody knows who Thrasio is, right? But especially here in the UK and, and in the rest of Europe, uh, we hadn't heard of you guys. <laughs> um, yeah. and, 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 you know, the Thrasio team was a fraction of what it is now. I used a broker, um, which, which was the right decision. And 
after going through their process, I was introduced to Thrasio. And basically the, the conversations I had were all the right ones. You know, what was, despite the size of the organization, the first call I had was with Josh at the top, you know? And so when you're, you're speaking to, 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 to very senior people straight off the bat, it really makes you feel like you matter and you're not just like some cog. And uh, he said that he, you know, he loved the brand and that meant a lot to me. Um, and then, well, basically everyone loved the brand. And as we progressed, you know, we start talking about numbers and considering the environment at the time and the valuation of the business and the where multiples were at the time, et cetera. Um, I felt like, you know, everything was fair. Um, I spoke with a lot of people in the organization, as you would expect during the due diligence process, um, and generally just, you know, was impressed by um, how on it everyone was and how interested people were in me and my brand, rather than just seeing it as just like, oh, it's just another asset that we're going to buy. Um, you know, uh, I wasn't, me and my brand were not just some tiny cog in a big machine which is really important because of course sellers need to know that uh, whoever's going to be running their business is going to be doing a good job of it because of course there's the earnout to think about. For sure. Yeah. Um, okay. So do the deal with Thrasio. Boom. Uh, you know, a, a bank wire, a check hits your bank account. How did you, yep. how did you react to that? Um, both the good and the bad, let's say. I took a screenshot of my uh, bank balance um, because uh, I was not sure that it would ever be that high again. Um, and uh, it was, it was, it was really odd actually, because like, I, I'm not, and you know, me and my family, we're not like very, um, we don't really care about like stuff. We're not like materialistic. And so I didn't like go out and on like a crazy spending spree. Uh, we went to the next day or maybe the weekend, we went to like a really modest restaurant and had burgers. Um, and then just kind of continued with life, you know? Uh, I was still, you know, it was, it, the, there was quite a lot of sort of transition stuff to do with, with you know, handing Vizquier over to Thrasio, that type of thing. I, it, it did feel weird, like not being in charge anymore. Um, it felt like a relief because if you think you've worked you think you've worked hard in your business and then it comes to selling it. Like the due diligence process is intense, quite rightly, right? Anyone buying a business needs to do their homework. You know, at one point I thought someone from Thrasia was going to come around my house and scam my residence. Like that's how intense it was, which, you know, it was good, right? And so it's just like this big sigh of relief. And the deal was done on Halloween, 2019. And it went down to it went down to the wire because there was some stuff to, to sort out, right? Uh, nothing bad. It was just like the differences between how things are done from a tax point of view in the UK and the states. And I think I was only like the second U UK or European acquisition that you had done. So there was like just communicating some of this stuff, and so it was it was really intense. And after it was done, there was just a big sigh of relief. Um, and uh, then there was yeah, when the money hit my bank account, I was just. I just kind of laughed because it was just crazy. It was just like, whoa, bank balance has never been that, that good before. Probably never will be again. Um, yeah, I've gotten a, a few good pieces of advice from uh, when that situation happens. Uh, one is uh, get stupid out of your system. So if you had one childhood dream of something, just go and do it within reason and then just tell yourself it's like, that's it for this. Right, and then go back to to regular life, and, and this is from a person who's had like four exits, yeah, over the years, and and some ups and downs. Uh, and to me, I, I I found that to be uh, um, fairly sound advice. And then also just realize that it is like a twenty four hour, forty eight hour elation, and then it's sort of back to trying to figure out what to do with the rest of your time. And I, I always think of like this this foolhardy goal, and I there's you know, some people I respect who, who talk about this is sort of like, all right, you're sitting on the beach with your pina colada. Now what? Yeah. Like, what, what are you gonna do that for? You're gonna do that for two weeks? You're gonna do that two years? Yeah. You're gonna turn to some weird like beach drunk? 
right? Yeah. That's not, you, you know, it's that's like, that's boring. not, that's the, your vision has to go be beyond that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I mean, uh, the way it was for me, right, was, you know, when I made the decision to sell, I, I said before that it felt like the right thing for me and my family. So when I made the, de- when I made the decision to sell, I knew that I could, that could we, I could make sure that we were financially secure and never had to worry. So that was a, a big sense of that. And I, you know, uh, I said that I'm not particularly materialistic, but uh, in the several months before I sold, I did spend a lot of time on the Tesla website. Um, and so, yeah, I bought a Tesla. Um, there you go. <laughs> I got it out of my system. It's in the drive right now. It's awesome. Um, but apart from that, not much has changed. You know, I, I, the first, almost the first thing I did was I, I uh, went to see an inter- independent financial advisor and, because you know what I was saying before about um, with a, a trademark attorney is use an expert to uh, sort that stuff out. The same comes to money, right? You know, I'm good at e-commerce and running an e-commerce business, but I, and I could get good at the financial side, you know, in terms of uh, investments, et cetera, but I don't have the capacity or bandwidth to do that. And i very much have a philosophy of um, pay peanuts, get monkeys, right? Mm-hmm. Get a professional. So I, got a professional. And um, as a consequence, everything is looked after, um, you know, taken away, growing nicely and nothing to worry about. And uh, life hasn't changed much and we still live in the same house and we're just, we're doing all right. And and here's the interesting piece too, when you have an event like Ben had, it's fortunate enough to have, um, and, and you go back into business and you, you know, you put your boots back on and give it another shot. It's, it's, easier in a way and here's why right it's it's one thing to be playing for a hundred dollars a hand in poker when you know your bank account only has two grand in it right like your your threshold for risk is pretty low right and you're you're probably not going to be as aggressive as you need to be to succeed but what's really great about having a little bit of success and then going into business again is that you're you're your whole perception around risk and what is possible changes. And if there's anything that, that gives us an advantage as an organization, right. Is that we can take gambles that other people, it's just not as easy for them to do as individuals. So to find success, to have it tangible and tactile and in your hands, and then be able to start over again from a position of strength is, uh, is really something that, you know, everyone on this call should consider if, if, and when they get to that point. Yeah. So, I, I point. agree with that. And yeah, if I can I, just, sorry, Brandon, go ahead. I was going to say, the other thing you mentioned too, on the financial advisor front, I mean, a lot of people would try to learn and try to do that stuff, but you know, thinking about how do you continue to focus on your strengths and to, instead of trying to improve all your weaknesses yes. is a, is a nice way to, to continue. Cause you, you focus on the success that you've already had versus distracting yourself with other things that you can help and get other people to help you with. Exactly. It's, just, it's a bit like hiring in your business, right? Focus on the stuff you're, you're strongest at and hire for your weaknesses. Um, and just, you know, on the topic of, of like, if you're thinking about selling, the thing is that after, now that I've sold, two things are true with regards to me building new brands. You know, that's, I'm doing several things, but one is I'm building new brands. One is that uh, I have this safety net. So the pressure's off. And when the pressure's off, it's like when um, top athletes are feeling the pressure because they haven't been performing and then they get worse and worse and worse, right? But when, as soon as they, they score that goal or shoot that basket or whatever, suddenly uh, the baskets and the goals and everything just keeps coming because the pressure's off, right? And they feel free. When you've got that safety net of that cushion of, you know, it's okay if this goes wrong, like actually it won't go wrong because you're going to operate as your best self. The other great thing is that once you've had an exit and you've got a bit of money behind you, suddenly uh, products, niches, brands, ideas with a higher barrier to entry become possible because you have the capital to make it happen. And those are the areas with way less competition where you can absolutely crush it. So that's one of the strategies that I'm doing now is entering niches with a higher barrier to entry in terms of the capital required to get started. I remember a, like a book I read, it was a, about a sports psychologist. I, I don't remember the basketball player, but he, he had worked with one of the, the best as far as percentage shooters in the entire NBA. And he asked him sort of like, what, how does he look at it? He's like, well, um, when I'm on a cold streak, I just think I'm bound to hit the next one. 
And when I'm on a hot streak, I think, well, this next one's going in because I'm hot. Nice. So it's, but it's just like, no matter what, it's sort of like a, a, a wave of optimism and it sort of speaks again to the, the commitment. But once you have the success, you're more orientated to, to have that different mindset. And Ben, I couldn't agree with you more on the types of products that, that are higher cogs items that have lower competition. We've, we've certainly seen that, you know, from the data that we've collected and from the work that we've done. Um, and it's just, just, just think about it too. If, if, you were going to be untoward, right? And you entered a category like knee sleeves or popsicle sticks. You could buy 20,000 units for, you know, a couple grand, maybe less. Yeah. And that's a lot of things to give away, to undersell, to try to cheat with. It's just easier to do that in a category like that. But if you were going to sell, um, you know, wolf ranges that have a COGS of $4,800, then uh, the the propensity to do that would reduce yeah. greatly. You so it's a really good around. really good point, Ben. Well, I know uh, we're hitting yeah. question time here, and we're we're over time. So yeah. Eileen, you need to drop the hammer on us next time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Let's start with Rick. Hi, Rick. Hey guys, how's it going? Good. Good, 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 good to see you again. Oh, thank you. Uh, ben, my question was for uh, running your business up until acquisition. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you run it yourself or did you have a team? And if so, like what specific roles did you hire for first? Like how did you manage them on a day to day? Uh, that's really what I'm curious on. Yeah. Uh, for about the first year and a half, I was on my own. Uh, and then I hired my first uh, virtual team member. I don't like calling them virtual assistants because I, I feel like that term is almost a little bit demeaning because they're way more than an assistant. They're an important part of the team. Um, and uh, she was responsible for customer service. And then I hired a uh, an assistant. I don't want to call them an assistant, a team member, a freelance virtual team member. Let's call them that a remote team member. There you go to do uh, social media and then brought on someone else again to help with customer service because we were expanding and we needed more support there. So uh, by the time I sold, it was me and three others, but we were, we were really at the point, probably a little bit past the point where we needed even more than that, really. Got it. So you're actually doing your own inventory management, doing the ordering, saving, yep. really? Yep. Okay. But I had a lot of it down to, you know, um, it was all really well organized and I, you know, it, it, it didn't take me long to put together a PO and, and, and order something. Got it. Okay. Makes because sense. I've done it so many times. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Thanks for, uh, thanks for your question. All right, next one. Tyreek, you would like to ask your question? Hi guys, great to listen to this webinar and the ones before. I'm Hi. in Miami, Florida. Uh, good to see you, Ben. Uh, my question is how do you find and where do you find the VAs you need so, so, so urgently? No problem. Uh, there are uh, probably three main resources I would recommend. Um, Upwork.com. Uh, free up, um, which is F R E E up. It used to be F R E E E up, uh, but that's changed. And onlinejobs.ph. Those are three excellent resources. Fiverr is okay for one-off stuff, but I um, I wouldn't be looking to hire someone on there long term. Ben, the third one you mentioned sounds like from Philippines. Uh, how Correct. was uh, no discrimination or anything? What was your experience? I heard very good things about that. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, Filipinos generally are lovely, lovely people, extremely loyal. Uh, the three uh, people on my team were all from the Philippines. Uh, I still work with them. Um, they were, you know, they were involved during the handover, and then and then some things were taken in house by Thrasio. I still I'm involved uh, with those guys. I. I class them as friends. I, I tuned in on a live Zoom call to one of them's wedding last week. Um, uh, and I can't wait for COVID to be over so I can go over there. One final one, if I may. At the time of handover, Tracio may or may not be interested, but if I'm buying a business, I'll be interested in hanging on to the VA for the continuity purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's no problem for us. Yeah. We sort right. of like, we, we try to be a la carte as much as we can when we right. acquire a business. Everyone has different needs and desires. So some people want their people taken care of for a fixed amount of time, or they want to take their people with them. 
um, and we accommodate all of those requests. And some people want to participate in the growth of the brand, and, and we encourage that as well. Would you throw some bonuses uh, their way for, for them to hang on? Um, it, it, really, it really depends on what functions they serve. If they're redundant uh, functions, we'll generally have an agreed upon date as to how long they will be carried on. Um, if, however, they add some unique value to the brand uh, or they can be rolled into our growth at Thrasio, then we consider you know, working that out. So it's really, it really is like um, dependent on, on each and every business. And we've had all kinds of different situations come out of it. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you no guys. I appreciate sure. it. No problem. Cheers, Tariq. Great. All right. Our next is Paul. Hey, Ben. Very interesting story. Sorry, thank you for telling this. Uh, no worries. Hi, Val. Um, I'm interested in their, uh, their cross-marketing things, like when you believe you have tested your product already on Amazon, right? And this is going up, right? At which stage do you think it should be like, you put a Shopify and uh, put a more social media efforts like Facebook, Insta, right? And kind of any advice in terms of like organic push on that and cross marketing efforts. So how do you, at which stage do you think it, it, it's time to go like beyond Amazon and just use that outside resources to uh, create a leverage and synergies? Sure. I, I really think it's important to have um a presence outside of Amazon from the very start, really. If you're building a brand, for, for, for a first point of view, it, it helps with things like brand registry. And if you ever need to change your listings and you need proof that you're the brand owner, you can direct them to your website. But it helps to, you know, many, many people are, are comfortable shopping on Amazon and they're going to buy a product on Amazon, but they want to see your Facebook page. They want to see your Instagram. They want to see your own website. To, to get a feeling of authenticity and legitimacy about your brand. So if you're building a real brand and, and you're not just selling a collection of stuff, um, I think you need these social media assets and your own website really from the get-go. Um, does, does that help? Um, you know, yeah, I, I think- Absolutely, yeah. Like, and, and, and the related question is that uh, this marketing efforts, you mentioned some resources where you hire people. Do you, do you take people say to take a, uh, to manage your social media, say from the same, like uh, hire people from Philippines or somewhere else in the world where they have enough uh, feeling about a uh, specific of the say US market, right? So do you have this natural thing? Because it could be different, right? So, or you, you still control that because not people don't always feel the culture and could be not very appealing messages on, on, a, on a social media, right? Not always. Of course. So how do you approach that? So to begin with, um, when I first hired uh, my team member for social media, um, I'll, I needed to, to give quite a lot of direction and instruction. But over time, as they became to understand the identity of the brand and who our customers were, less and less instruction was needed. And they were able to really take care of pretty much everything themselves. And I think you'll find the same is true for whatever your brand is. Uh, as the team member becomes integrated and they become comfortable with your brand and who your customer demographic is, they will, you, they'll need less and less direction. And you can, you can show them your competitors who are doing a good job on Instagram, maybe, or Facebook or YouTube or whatever it is, and uh, tell them to take inspiration from that. You know, take a look at Beast Gear's Instagram if you want for kind of to get an idea of what I'm talking about. The handle's Beast Gear UK. That is still, still run, you know, not by me. Uh, and yeah. uh, it's, they're doing a great job. Mm -hmm. 10,000 followers, 5,000 on Facebook. Yeah, I see. Thanks. Yeah, good question, Paul. Cool. Right. Of Our next question we have, um, Ben, can you give some insight into managing cash flow for scaling up from your first one to two products to five plus products? Yeah, it's tricky. Um, you know, it, it, it can be hard. Um, I always, you know, a lot of brands will scale faster than I did to begin with. Um, and I, uh, I, I only added new uh, product lines as I could afford it. The good news is that, you know, the landscape has changed quite a lot since I first started in early 2016. Some point, maybe a year, year and a half in, Amazon started to bring out Amazon loans, um, which in my opinion are a complete no-brainer. The interest rate is low. And when you pay it back, they offer you more money. Um, and they know you can pay it back because they, they know what your sales numbers are. It, you know, they don't know your external numbers on your own website, but they know what you're doing on Amazon. So if you get offered an Amazon loan, if you can afford it, take it. 
Um, but there are other options for, for capital out there. Um, there are lots of services now, um, Yardline's one of them, uh, offering capital um, to uh, e-commerce brands um, to help them to scale up. So that's definitely something you should consider. But you know, um, be sensible. Make sure that you're not spending cash on a new product that's going to cause you to run out of inventory on your best sellers. You know, um, you see when you take people. when you take a loan out too, it's it's very incumbent uh, on on all of you to make sure that you're spending it on something that's going to get you a quick return. Yes. So don't use debt money to launch products. Use debt money to buy inventory that you know you're going to get back quickly. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Launch a product when you know you can afford to launch a product. Essentially. Yes. So there, there is no magic bullet, which is why it goes back to uh, the really important fact that if you're taking out money, it needs to be put to a direct purpose that will get returns. So that doesn't become a factor for you, right? Because there, any loan given to you is going to come with some level of collateral and default, or the interest rate is going to go way up. There's the one and have less collateral. Those, that, those are basically the way that the function, that market functions. So what I would do is, is just like... Uh, look at a few, don't, don't overthink it. You don't want to like fight over a point or two here or there and look at two or three and read them, read them carefully and figure out which one's best for you. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, John. Uh, that's what they did. And they're uh, found out that Pioneer has no contract. So basically they, they have a term. So I still probably find this condition term something, but it looks like it's easier. And there, there are a few other guys still reviewing. So absolutely uh, good advice. Thanks. Cheers, well. Great. Great. Um, so as we wrap up, um, Ben, my question is, what are you doing now? If you could tell us a little bit about econ brokers and then your last tips that you have for the audience. Absolutely. Um, I'm doing several things. I guess I have three hats. Uh, hat one is I'm building new brands, um, partly because I love it and partly because of the other two hats. So hat number two is I consult. So I help e-commerce business owners, um, get clear on, on where they are and where they want to go, take control of their business because e-commerce can be very overwhelming and there's a lot of information coming at you from all directions and then scale up. And I, I like to think that I'm the antidote to the, the gurus that are out there because I've actually been there and done it. Um, and so because of that hat, I, that's part of the reason I'm still building brands because I can't very well tell people and consult with people on this industry unless I actually have skin in the game and I'm still in it because it's still moving so fast. And then hat number three is e-com brokers. So after uh, going through the process of selling my business, um, using a broker, um, myself and my accountant, who, who played Allison, who played a really important role in getting the business ready to sell, we put our heads together and felt like we could do a really good job of bringing something a little bit different to that space. So uh, we, uh, we're a little bit different to some of the other brokers out there who will just sort of you know take your business now and, and just say, yeah, we'll sell it for you. We work with people who uh, perhaps have a goal in mind or they want to sell. They, you know, they might want to sell now, but maybe their business isn't particularly well set up to sell. Um, and we will work with them to get them really nicely built to sell. And that naturally results in a much better deal for them. Um, but we'll also work with people who may have a goal to sell in six months or at a, when they reach a certain valuation, maybe a year, two years from now. Um, and we'll work with them over that period of time. Me with my e-commerce experience and Allison with her two decades in mergers and acquisitions, and she's a specialist e-commerce accountant. Many times people have this kind of goal in mind, which is, yeah, I want to sell to Thrasio. Um, and that's fantastic. But many times you simply perhaps are too small or not the right business for that type of acquisition yet. When you work with us, hopefully after working with us, you will be. Uh, or if, if you're not quite the right fit for Thrasio, we'll, uh, we'll get you in ship shape so that you're, you're the right fit for for, uh, for the right buyer for your business. And that, that's key. It's, it's the right buyer for the business, right? It needs to be, you know, it, it, there are a lot of aggregators in this space now, but many of them, they know how to raise money, but they don't know the first thing about running an e-commerce business. So we'll make sure that, that your business is sold to, 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 to people who, who do. So that's ecombrokers.co.uk. It's a, it's a UK domain, but we're, we're working globally. And yeah, thanks for having me. It's been oh, great. Awesome. Ben, thank you so much. No worries. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Thanks everyone. It's been a really, really great conversation and thanks for participating and thanks for the questions folks. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ben. That was awesome. Great story and great information. Cheers. This was, this was a good one. Uh, thanks everyone who visited us today and we look forward to seeing you uh, next week. And Ben, I, re I really appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you.